Okay, well, hi everybody. I'm Katie Fleming, the Community Engagement Director at Friends of the San Juans. Um, for those of you that don't know us, although I see a lot of familiar names who do know us, it's great to see all your names on the screen. Um, but for those of you who don't know, we're a nonprofit organization with a mission to protect and restore the San Juan Islands and the Salish Sea. This is our very first webinar and we're hoping to make a series out of this. So we hope you love it. And um, of course, forgive any technical issues we may have. Um, the summer is usually the season where our staff are out exploring and appreciating the islands with our community. So since we can't be with you in person right now, um, we're excited to partner with Peter on this exciting talk tonight that will expand our knowledge of wildlife around the world. I'll turn it over to Peter shortly, but um, just a bit of housekeeping first. Um, please make sure to mute yourself. Um, we will be using the Q&A function that you'll notice at the bottom of your screen. So everyone just take a minute, locate that down there. Um, if you have a question during the presentation, go ahead and write your presentation as you have it. And then at the end of the talk, I will um, read those questions to Peter. Um, so, yep, so just type them in as we go and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. Michelle, my coworker and our director of philanthropy at Friends is monitoring the chat function, just in case has anyone has any technical questions as we move forward with the presentation today. Um, so just a little bit about Peter before I hand it over to him. Um, we are so um, lucky to have Peter in our community. He's a Pacific Northwest photographer who specializes in photographing birds in flight. His interest in bird flight combines his love of nature, his professional training in biomechanics, his background as an instrument-rated private pilot, and his passion for photography. Peter is a former NASA researcher, retired UW professor, author, and filmmaker, among many other things. He's also currently working on a film about the threats of an oil spill in the Salish Sea. Um, so thank you so much for joining us tonight, Peter. I am happy to now virtually introduce you and live from Lopez Island, it's all you. Katie, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to the friends who are on Zoom tonight and spending part of your evening with me. Uh, friends of the San Juans holds a special place in my heart. The things that you all do for our wildlife and environment make such a difference in this very special place. So thank you for all that you do. Well, tonight's talk was supposed to be a continuation of the, what I've done for the last two years, and it's a rolling talk on San Juan Island, on Orcas, and on Lopez, but here we are tonight in a, an era where travel is not defined by where you go, but defined by the places you've canceled from going. I'm sure many of you have done the same as I have. Uh, my cancellations right now include um, Panama, Ecuador, the Galapagos, uh, Namibia coming up, and so who knows when we'll be able to do those things again. So I'm sure many of you uh, have got the wanderlust as I do, and as I share my screen with you now, um, you'll see that we are going to, uh, we're going to visit uh, a number of countries and we're going to, I'm going to introduce you to about 45 birds, which uh, many of them are what I call iconic birds of the world, birds that uh, people really value seeing and some of them are endangered, some of them critically so. So I want to start right here on uh, uh, Lopez Island. Here's the trip we're going to be taking. We're going to uh, go uh, perimeter of the world in this particular and uh, we're going to end up right where we started on Lopez Island where I am sitting just a stone's throw from a nest of this bird that I have been following for the last uh, 18 months and this is a bird that came back with uh, with its young from Mexico and through the help of a friend I was able to find the exact tree that it comes to perch on before it goes fishing. The uh, uh, ospreys, of course, when you zoom in on those feet, have got these very special spicules under their feet here to prevent fish from falling out once they've grabbed them. And if you see these talons in a radiograph, you can see that the bony underlying uh, surface has got this extended talon like our own nails made of keratin. And here you can see in this uh, image that the, bird, the very same bird has put its talon right the way through this fish that it's about to devour. 
Now, I took this slow motion video at the nest last year. And this young bird, just because it's bored, has picked up some dead fish tails from the nest and is hovering above the nest, not going forward, not going backwards. And you'll notice that its wings are going horizontally. It's driving them down and forward. So it has lift, but no progression, it has no thrust. You might have seen its sibling also decide that uh, that was just too much showing off and he was hiding in the back of the nest. Well, our first, the first leg of our journey is up to Boundary Bay in British Columbia. Now, of course, this is actually a trip that we can't take right now because of the border closures. But just a stone's throw from Lopez Island, occasionally we get an eruption of snowy owls. When there's not enough food in their northern latitudes, they come down looking for food. And at the time this photograph was taken, there were about 25 birds on Boundary Bay in British Columbia. Their flight patterns are really quite remarkable and they've got beautiful wings and specializations so that they can have quiet flight without their prey knowing that they're actually approaching. Now you'll notice that I have a red badge on all of my images here. And this badge says that the snowy owl is vulnerable and vulnerable to extinction that is. And this would be a very good time to introduce the red list from the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And they have rated every single organism, plant and animal in the world regarding its threat for extinction. And these are the categories of the uh, birds we will see tonight. Many of them fortunately are at least concerned. That doesn't mean they're not, their numbers are not decreasing because most of them are. Some are near threatened. And then these three categories of vulnerable, endangered, and critically endangered rank birds on their likelihood of becoming extinct, some of them in our lifetime. Well, let us now take a trip up to Alaska. We uh, can get on a uh, Alaska Airlines flight at SeaTac. We can arrive in Juneau, and a short flight from Juneau will take us out over to Sitka Sound, a magnificent place uh, on an island, in the Baranoff Islands in Alaska. The additional joy of going to Alaska in the spring is that the herring spawn is in full progress. And at that time, bald eagles line up to take their food from the uh, oncoming herring. What I love about eagles and about photographing eagles is how incredibly acrobatic they are. Their acrobatics are stunning to behold, such as this bird on the left pulling a tight 360 degree turn. I was fortunate in April 2019 to be visiting during the, uh, the, the herring spawn. And this video with the ravens in the background shows you a mass of bald eagles just dipping into the water and pulling out the herring. There, he's got one right there. There's a bird that's got one, but another one's here. Seeing so many eagles together in one place is really quite amazing. And they're, in some parts of Alaska, they're as common as crows are in our area. Well, it's time to move on. And um, since Iceland Air has a flight from SeaTac direct, we can leave SeaTac at 3.15 tomorrow. And in the afternoon, we'll be uh, on our way to Iceland. Because there are currently around uh, 22 hours of daylight, in, we'll be able to look out of the window and see the decreasing ice cap of, of Greenland that you see here. But we'll arrive in Reykjavik at about 6 a.m. in the morning 
ready to rent a car and go to this absolutely remarkable place where puffins inhabit the Lauterberg bird cliff in Iceland. This cliff is about 15 miles long and in some places more than a thousand feet tall. The puffins, this one preening, live on the very fringe of the cliff where they make their nests in burrows. Because their wings are made for both flying and swimming underwater, they're really very poor flyers. And one of the reasons they live on top of the cliff is they push off from the cliff and drop like a stone until their flapping moth-like wings get them enough lift to maintain a steady flight path. Of course, the money shot for a photographer is a picture of puffins bringing back sand lamps to their nest. And uh, this bird has got a fistful, uh, mouthful coming back uh, with that food. Now, from Keflavik Airport, we can take a, a direct two hour flight to, uh, to Glasgow. And then we can take a picturesque train ride through the mountains up to the Isle of Mull, where the picture postcard village of Tobamori is waiting to host our visit. The big attraction in Mull is that white-tailed eagles, white-tailed sea eagles have been reintroduced. Eagles have not, these eagles have not been in Britain for a hundred years. They have been extinct mostly from hunting and loss of habitat. And now a thriving group of bald eagles, of, uh, excuse me, of sea eagles are in, uh, in, in presence at the, the, the locks in Scotland. And to see them flying against this absolutely stunning landscape of the Scottish locks is really a, a quite wonderful sight. These eagles have such visual acuity that they will perch uh, a mile away from the boat that you're on. And if the skipper of the boat tosses in a fish, they will come straight towards it like a guided missile, knowing exactly where it was, take it and go back to their perch. The original birds, these birds actually, the ancestors of these birds were introduced from Norway. And Norway is our next port of call. Um, from Oslo Airport, I uh, drove, took another uh, flight up to the, uh, the town of um, uh, Levanga, and it was one of the most bizarre guiding experiences I've ever had. I met the guide at a gas station. He hardly spoke to me and just said, follow me. And I followed him for about two hours through uh, really quite beautiful, small Swedish, uh, small Norwegian mountains. And we eventually left the car, we hiked up the hillside, and he pulled a tent out from underneath the bushes. And he looked at me and he said, pitch that, get in it, don't come out till six o'clock, I'll see you in the morning. And I didn't really know what was going on, but what was going on is that he had discovered the lek of this bird, a near threatened bird called the great snipe that migrates to Norway from North Africa. This uh, rather unprepossessing looking bird transforms itself to this as he gets absolutely as big as possible, struts his stuff, flicks his wings, and practices dance to uh, attract a female. If he is successful, then maybe a female will appear out of the brush and they will form a pair bond. The, uh, the great snipe is, uh, uh, as I said, a, a near threatened bird and it's threatened by loss of habitat on both ends of its migration route. The actual flashing of the wings is so fast that this video, uh, a reconstruction of actual still images doesn't catch it, but you can see how the bird does this remarkable dance. By six o'clock, all the birds had gone. Uh, the guide reappeared, and uh, that was the end of our rather brief and uh, rather strange interaction. Well, it's now time for a really long haul flight. Tokyo is seven hours ahead of Oslo, uh, but Finnair will take a total of 12 hours and 50 minutes to get us there with a stopover in Helsinki. 
Our goal is uh, to change airports in Tokyo and fly up to uh, Kushiro on the south coast of the island of Hokkaido, as long as the wind is not too strong for a landing, as it almost was uh, when I went one very stormy February night. But the prize is really worth this long and difficult journey. The display of the red crowned Japanese cranes is one of the most exquisite dances in the animal world. These birds have been elevated to almost sacred status in Japan. They are revered for their fidelity and a likeness of red crowned cranes is often embroidered on a wedding kimono in Japan to wish the young couple similar faithfulness for their life. These cranes are very gregarious birds. They never fly alone. And so there's plenty of opportunities for flight shots of several birds together. And they often leap into the air with uh, absolute dramatic exuberance. And this image taken in a blinding snowstorm is a, a very good example of how bad, bad weather can really be advantageous uh, to photographers. A little further north, there is a finger of land uh, called the Nemuro Peninsula that sticks out towards islands owned by Russia. Sarah Palin would be very pleased because you actually can see Russia from the tip of the Nemuro Peninsula. And it was there that I encountered this magnificent largest of all eagles, the Stella's Sea Eagle. These birds migrate from the Bering Sea in Russia to Hokkaido for the winter. They have an enormous bill, a white leading edge on the wings, a white tail, and up to an eight foot wingspan. It's actually the same genus as our bald eagles. And just like the bald eagles, the female can be larger. But in this case, the female can be 80% larger than the male. Well, for our next port of call, a uh, 35 hour train ride or uh, a five hour flight will take us to the very southern tip to the prefecture of Kagoshima in Japan, where we see another uh, breed of cranes. And this is the white naped crane, very elegant bird. About a half of the world's population of white naped cranes comes down to the Izumi Crane Observation Center in the winter to spend winter knowing they're going to get a free lunch every single day. The staff there provide uh, rice and grain that they put out in the morning. And the scene is really quite incredible as you'll see from this video uh, taken at the time. So here all the birds are heads down feeding. And then something happens. And a couple put their heads up, a few more put their heads up. And then they all put their heads up. And then having convinced themselves that there's no danger, down they go again. By late February, they are gone, and they've gone back to Mongolia, northeastern China. It's interesting that these birds, a few of these birds get left behind in the demilitarized zone in Korea, where they stay more or less year round. And so they have become known uh, as a symbol of peace uh, to the two Koreas. Well, we need to get back to Tokyo. And with a brief stop in Melbourne, Qantas Airlines is going to fly us to Sydney, where some really interesting birds uh, can be seen right in the center of the city at, for example, in the Botanical Garden in Sydney. What could be more Australian than a laughing kookaburra? This is a very common and uh, uh, unique kingfisher. It's widespread and are thought to be more than 65 million of these birds, very common in the whole of Western Australia. 
from exactly the same spot as I took this shot uh, of the kookaburra, here is a sulfur crested cockatoo. To us, this is a very exotic bird, but it's actually considered to be a pest in some parts of Australia. And many websites deal with ways that you can get rid of the sulfur cockatoo from your farmlands. It's also a very popular aviary bird in, in pet stores. And I looked at a US website today where a young bird was offered for $6,500. They've resisted uh, the pressure of collection to move towards extinction, and these birds are actually at least concerned and have been very successful in their spread across Western Australia. There are so many birds to see in Australia, but we're going to see just one more. I'm going to take you on a brief trip up to the Daintree River in the far northern Queensland to see this very beautiful bird called a little kingfisher. It only is four inches in total length, it weighs 10 to 15 grams, about the size of four sugar cubes, and it lives in the mangrove swamps, feeding on tiny fish and crustaceans, and it dives completely submerged to pull them out. The, uh, the bird is a, uh, uh, a relative of a, a number of other kingfishers distributed throughout Australasia that we'll, we'll see a couple more uh, also in Africa. Well, we're off on another long haul flight this time. Uh, Qantas will take us from Sydney to Johannesburg, a flight of 14 hours and 10 minutes, and we'll certainly need a night's rest to shake off the jet lag. Before leaving to the bush, we'll make a pilgrimage to Nelson Mandela's house in Soweto, where this dramatic sculpture commemorates the massacre of school children in June 1976, almost to the day, June 16th, that sent shockwaves around the world and, and was a real crack in the foundations of apartheid. A short flight from Johannesburg will take us to Nelspruit, and this will be right outside one of the most spectacular national parks in the world, the Kruger National Park. The saddle bill stork, or sometimes called the German flag bird because of its colors, is a bird that I have been waiting to get a flight shot of for more than five years. This has included staking out uh, a nest at this that you see here. This is a bird standing on top of its nest. I was there the whole afternoon and the bird did little more than stretch, yawn, stand up and sit down. But finally, uh, when my daughter and I were together in South Africa, we were able to see this magnificent bird and I was able to photograph him in flight. Now everyone who's been to the Lion King loves hornbills and uh, although Zazu in the Lion King is a red hornbill, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the very strange habits and history of the yellow-billed hornbill. So here you see a male yellow-billed hornbill delivering a very tasty centipede into a hole in the side of this tree. But what's going on here? And here you see what's going on. Inside the tree, the female bird has crawled into a cavity in the tree. And the male and the female together have sealed the entrance, except for the tiniest little, and that's the slot that the male is putting his food through. Now, it gets even stranger. The female, once she gets in, she does what's called a simultaneous molt. And that's, that is she sheds every single one of her flight feathers before she lays her eggs. So she is completely dependent on the male for sustenance. Of course, they've been, uh, she's sealed in to defend the chicks and the nest from predators. But while she's in there, she is totally dependent on the male. And interestingly, research shows that less than 0.5% of males don't do their duty. They do not abandon the nest and they feed the female continuously and feed the chicks continuously until they're all ready to emerge from the nest cavity. Here you see a, 
a, a video of the male delivering his centipede to the nest. Here he comes. Maybe here he comes. No, I think we've lost him. Well, not far from the previous encounter, in the very north of the park in Pufuri, another hornbill is doing the same kind of feeding ritual. This beautiful bird has got a cask above its bill here. And his strategy is uh, not to cling on to the tree, such as the other hornbill did, but he, his strategy is to just dangle things in to the nest. Now, this video, with hippos in the background, because we're right alongside the Lafuba River, shows the hornbill coming, and this time, in uh, order to give his mate a balanced diet, he has come with a, uh, a group of seeds that he's collected on his last foraging trip. I won't bore you with the entire video, but he actually spent a total of five minutes regurgitating a total of 62 seeds before he cleaned up the nest and then flew away uh, to get his next consignment of food for his mate and the chicks. Another extremely industrious bird in the Kruger National Park is this southern masked weaver. The weaver has built this beautiful nest that you see here. He's just finished it and he's inviting female birds to come and take a look. Typically, several females will inspect his nest, they'll inspect other nests, and uh, finally, one of them likes it and decides they're going to settle down and make a home with this young man. But the question is, how does the bird start this beautifully finished nest? How does he make a start to it and how does he build? Well, he takes single strands of grass and then, as you see here, he starts by putting a ring in between the fork in a branch in a tree. He works very fast. This is normal speed video. This is not speeded up. He weaves in and out, tremendously skillfully, reaching, pulling, pushing, and making this initial ring that's going to allow him to start and then build out his very beautiful These are communal nesters, and so the noises you hear are from many other of the same species, and they all build their nest in close proximity. So when the females go on a home tour, they don't have to really go very far out of their way. Well, I promised you an ostrich, and here is an ostrich. It's a common ostrich. It's a, a magnificent monster of a bird that can be up to nine feet tall and it can run at speeds of up to 40 miles an hour. It's one of two flightless birds that, that we'll be seeing today. The ostrich uh, you'll see is of least concern at the present time, but that has not always been the case. Ostriches have had to survive Victorian habits of ostrich feathers being after decoration for hats and over the millennia ostrich eggs have been used as a variety of ornaments and containers such as this one which uh, was from 1400 years BC. The ostrich egg is the largest egg in the avian kingdom but when it's uh, considered re relative to body size it's actually a rather small egg for such a large bird. Well, we'll now drive back to Johannesburg and a short drive will take us to uh, the uh, airport and to the uh, flight to Maun, which is the airport which serves the Okavanga Delta. One of two, it's seven o'clock. One of two great waterways that we're going to see tonight. And we're only going to make a brief stop and we're going to see 
another kingfisher. This bird is the beautiful Malachite kingfisher, about the same size as the little kingfisher we saw in Australia. Um, if it catches something too large to swallow, just like a shrike, it will hit the fish against a branch until it's dead and then it can eat it piece by piece if it's too big for it to take in, in one swallow. The Malachites share the terrain with this somewhat larger pied kingfisher that's widely distributed in sub-Saharan Africa. Well, our transportation arrangements get a little complicated now because we want to go from Botswana down to the island of South Georgia in the South Atlantic. And as they say, you can't get there from here. So we've got to do uh, a little uh, dogleg here and we've got to go to Buenos Aires and down to the very southern tip of Argentina, a place called Ushuaia, the most southern city in the world where they boast 16 days when it doesn't rain and you can actually see the sky. One of the things I like to do uh, on my uh, preparation for trips is I like to, to make contact with a guide and see a bird in a, a location before I leave for a destination that uh, I might otherwise not have seen. And this was true here in the southernmost uh, national park in the world, the uh, uh, National Park of Tierra del Fuego, and the bird was the Magellanic woodpecker. It's a fairly common bird, very beautiful bird. This is the female, the male has a red head. But what's interesting about this bird is that it is in the same genus as the mythical ivory-billed woodpecker that you see here in uh, Audubon's, from Audubon's elephant. Uh, the Magellanic has managed to avoid the fate of the ivory-billed uh, woodpecker, which as far as we know uh, is extinct. Now for our next segment of the trip, we will be leaving air travel behind and we will meet up with our vessel, the Ushuaia. It's a 270 foot long boat, 50 feet wide. It used to be a NOAA research vessel and it has space for 90 passengers. It's got none of the frills that cruise ships have. It has no dynamic stabilization, no hot tubs, just the bare bones to get you to where you want to go to some very remarkable and wild places. And so um, as soon as the uh, boat gets underway, we start getting a retinue of following birds, including, for example, these two beautiful albatrosses flying in unison. But soon the water gets rough. And Let me see if I can play that video again. Yes. And the, uh, I don't think we're going to have success with this video. Well, soon the, the water breaks over the bow. Uh, 20 foot swells are not uncommon. But then after four days of sailing, there's a break in the weather. And we get our first sight of the remarkable island of South Georgia. That is, apart from a small settlement, at Great Bikin, completely uninhabited in its 100 mile length. And soon we're at Salisbury Plain, one of the most iconic places for seeing king penguins in the southern hemisphere. To be on the beach as these animals come ashore is a, an incredible experience. You feel that you're seeing a, a mass of uh, seething wildlife. And, and, and biomass is just uh, all around you. The colonies are quite remarkable places. Here you see the segmentation of the young that are left in a crash while the adults go, uh, go fishing. And in some amazing way, the adults are able to find their young amidst this colony of over 100,000 penguins. It's, quite a miracle as to how they do it. It's thought to be a combination of, as you would expect, smell and sound. You see a family here in an isolated part where 
the uh, the female seems to be disciplining the young and the the, the male is basically saying you carry on dear uh, it's all yours he's having nothing to do with it we were fortunate to be at salisbury plain on a day when it had snowed this year uh, last year and uh, on that day we were able to see remarkable scenes of penguins against the snow One of the things I love about places like South Georgia is you are so up close to the wildlife. They don't care about you in the slightest. They gaze at you with some vague interest and then carry on with the business of the day. And to be in a place like Salisbury Plain, where there are literally tens of thousands of birds is really a very unique and wonderful experience. Well, from South Georgia, we're going to do what I call a reverse Shackleton. Uh, those of you who have read Endurance, the Alfred Lansing account of uh, Shackleton's remarkable voyage, where he traveled in a small ship from Antarctica to South Georgia to rescue his crew members, uh, know what an epic story of hardship and leadership that is. Our trip to South Georgia, from South Georgia to Antarctica, was through similar seas that uh, Shackleton sailed in. And in fact, we did have a serious injury on board when one of our passengers fell down a stairway during very heavy seas and she sustained 10 fractures and had to be airlifted out of Antarctica in a rather epic uh, rescue that I described in my lecture last year. Fortunately, when we were there this year, the, the weather was calmer and there were no, uh, no such uh, need for, for uh, heroics. Our first stop is going to be Hydroga Rocks on the Antarctic Peninsula to see chinstrap penguins. <clears throat> now these chinstrap penguins in this picture remind me of a Mozart opera and they bring to life the, uh, what I think is the most beautiful trio in all of opera. In reality, the sound that chin straps make is very non-operatic, as you can hear from this recording. Very sort of annoying, work, but nonetheless quite atmospheric when you're in the middle of several hundred birds that are making this noise. They're very curious birds and make beautifully interesting stereotypic mute, uh, movements, sometimes mirroring each other's movements as you see with these two birds on the left. And also, they can be incurably cute, as you see uh, for this bird, which looks entirely like the kind of stuffed animal you'd give to your granddaughter. Well, our uh, travels back from South America to South America uh, are also potentially fraught with difficulty because the region of the ocean that's crossed down here is called Drake's Passage. And this can either be a, a, a disastrous and very uh, nausea-producing trip, or it can be 
uh, surprisingly calm, and I have seen it both ways. But the trip now uh, to Chile takes us just north of Tierra del Fuego National Park to see a bird, which is a bird that uh, I have seen in a number of different places that is truly one of nature's remarkable creations. Uh, the uh, Andean condor is, when you take its length and weight together, the largest bird in the world. It can have a wingspan of up to 10.5 feet. Its wings look here like the keys on a, on a piano keyboard. And it is a near threatened bird, um, partly because of poisoning, uh, partly because of uh, shooting. And some of these birds are still used in rituals uh, in Peru, particularly. And uh, this bird is still really on a lifeline. It is revered by many indigenous communities in South America. Remarkable place associated with the condor is the Temple of the Condor at Machu Picchu in, in Peru. We're now going to visit the Falkland Islands. And uh, travel to the Falkland Islands can be a little difficult politically. You cannot fly there from Argentina because Argentina does not recognize the British ownership of what they call the Malvinas Islands, despite their loss in the 1982 Falklands War, known as Maggie Thatcher's War. So we will fly from Punta Arenas in Chile, and we'll experience the delight of being flown around the islands in the Falklands uh, by the small Britain Norman aircraft of the Falkland Islands Air Service. And the first bird we'll meet is this uh, near threatened bird called a striated caracara. And you see it here uh, trying to drag the carcass of a gentoo penguin along the beach in uh, Carcass Island. These birds are threatened because uh, the farmers believe that they attack sheep and peck their eyes out. And so they were hunted relentlessly for many years. Uh, they, they somewhat ha now have reached a, an equilibrium and the birds are doing better, but they are endemic to the Falkland Islands. Very beautiful bird and very different from the southern car caracaras that you may have seen in Texas, Mexico, and uh, other Central and uh, South American countries. At Gro Grave Cove on uh, uh, West Falkland, I was privileged to be on the beach when a whole host of gentoo penguins came back from their afternoon of fishing. And they really were that close. And uh, uh, it, apart from the last group who didn't quite know what to make of these people holding cameras and lenses, the other penguins just were pretty much prepared to go on and find another place to get back to the colony. Another example of how you are so close to nature, it really makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Well, our next destination is another of the world's great wetlands, and this is going to be a difficult trip. Uh, Google Flights says you can't get there from here again, but if we make our way back to Buenos Aires and then uh, up to Rio de Janeiro with the LATAM or Azul Airlines, we can get to Cuiaba at the northern end of the Pantanal, which is an amazing wetland uh, and this bird awaits us. This is one of the more rare macaws in the world. It uh, presently is uh, vulnerable. It has moved uh, back into a more secure place recently because marked efforts have been made to stop trafficking. 
This bird I checked on a website today in the United States is being offered for between 10 and $40,000. So the trafficking of this bird still continues to this day, uh, despite the struggles that it has had. A very intelligent bird. These birds always fly in pairs. They are relentlessly faithful. Uh, and they, 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 make, uh, they always advertise their presence. They are playful and uh, just incredible birds uh, to watch. Well, still in Brazil, we're now going to take a little detour out to an island called Fernando de Noronha. This is an island in the middle of the uh, South Atlantic where uh, Darwin actually stopped uh, during his outward voyage on the Beagle. He didn't do much natural history there. He was much more interested in the geology of the island, which is a volcanic remnant. And we came to look at magnificent frigate birds. Uh, these birds are known as nature's pirates. And uh, the, the shot on the right is unusual because it's down on top of it from a cliff top, whereas the way we usually see them is here on the left. They are the pirates of the sky. They rarely land, but they steal food from other birds uh, to, uh, to make a living. Well, we're now going to head to what arguably is the, the greatest bird as paradise um, in, the, uh, in the hemisphere. And that is to Peru, where there are, in Peru and Colombia together, there are more species than in any other country in the world. And we're coming here, uh, we'll, fly from, um, we'll fly into Lima and then take a flight over um, to Cusco, the ancient Inca capital. And then we will take what's known as the Manu Road, a remarkable dirt track that goes up above 12,000 feet and then finds its way all the way down to Amazonia. This was just an absolutely remarkable trip with a great diversity birds. And this is the bird that we have, one of the birds we've come to see. This is a, um, a Andean cock of the rock. It's uh, a bird that's uh, in its, uh, uh, the only member of its, uh, of its genus. It's related to cottingers, which uh, are a larger family, but it's the most bizarre looking head where it actually has a crest, such that it looks as though it has a deformed head and like no other bird that I, that I know of. I had seen one previously um, flying by very quickly, but in this location on the Manor Road, there was a lek where the male birds all practice their mating dance together. Seems rather foolish because they're teaching each other the tricks that they're gonna need to attract a female, but that's what they do. And uh, they practice, the females don't show up for a long time, but the males go there every day to practice. And uh, I was privileged enough to be there uh, and, and watching what they did. Very close to there, we also saw this magnificent bird, a golden-headed quetzal, um, one of the family of quetzals, including the resplendent quetzals, which arguably are amongst the most spectacular birds in the world. At the bottom of the Mano Road, we get into Amazonia. And at the Tambo Pata National Reserve, there are a couple of birds I want to show you. This bird is a hoatze. And research has shown that this bird, which again is the only member of its genus, separated from the other birds about 65 million years ago. So this bird is a real remnant. It's also uh, got very strange a biology. It is a ruminant. That is, it's like a cow. It eats leaves and those leaves are fermented uh, in, uh, in the bird's um, upper digestive tract. And that's uh, one of the reasons why it's called a stink bird, because it's, it uh, emits the most awful smell from this uh, fermenting mass of leaves uh, that it feeds on very skittish bird and its young are distinguished by the fact that they have claws on the outside of their wings and they uh, if they fall in the water they can use those claws on the wings to 
climb back up again uh, into the nest. One of the great sites in the Tambo Pata Reserve is the Chuncho Clay Lake. Macaws come every day to the Clay Lake, and it's believed they come to replenish minerals that they don't get from the fruit that they eat. And it's an amazing sight. One travels there early in the morning, and the macaws start to arrive in their pairs, just like you saw the hyacinth macaws flying. They, they stay in the trees for a long time until they're sure it's safe. And then they send down some sentinels looking for uh, safety and that there are no hawks around. And if the sentinel survives, then all the rest of them come. And here you see a group which has got the scarlet macaws, which is this bird here, and red and green macaws, which are the majority of the birds on the lake here. And when one's watching, in an instant, something will spook them and they will fly away, uh, perhaps never to come back the whole day. And so sometimes you go and they never in the whole day come down to the clay lake. But when they do, it's a really spectacular sight like this. Well, in northern Peru, there is a bird that's one of the rarest that we will see today. And this is the marvelous spatula tail. Small hummingbird, there are less than a thousand of these birds in existence. And uh, this bird has the amazing extended quills uh, on its tail. And uh, it is only surviving in a single valley. These uh, quills have been hunted for, uh, for, for uh, trophies. And the bird is making a very slow comeback uh, together with the help of uh, a whole lot of uh, conservation authorities. This was a very dark day. And uh, for photographers, Rick, this one's for you. This was taken at 10,000 ASA, which was really pushing the limits on my, uh, on my camera. But to get this picture of a very unique bird, um, I had to push those limits to get the picture. Well, our next flight is a relatively easy two hours and 20 minutes from Lima to Quito on Latam Airlines. But when we get to Quito, we find that the airport is around 9,200 feet. And we might well need some acetazolamide to ease the symptoms of altitude symptoms, particularly since we're going to be pretty active there. In the Yanacocha Reserve, uh, just a short distance from the city of Quito, you can find this remarkable bird. Remarkable bird. This is a sword-billed hummingbird, a bird with the longest bill of any bird in the kingdom. The story of how hummingbirds and their preferred flowers have undergone a evolution <clears throat> is a remarkable one. And the hummingbird, the swordbill hummingbird's long bill has evolved because it feeds on these tubular flowers of Brugmasia, amongst other flowers. But it is the, it owns this food supply because it is the only bird that can reach the nectar at the bottom of, uh, of this flower. Well, Ecuador is actually the uh, country to which the Galapagos Islands belong. And <clears throat> we can take a flight from Quito. Usually the flights stop in Guayaquil, which as you may have read is one of the cities in South America that has been most devastated with deaths uh, from COVID-19. Fortunately, we don't have to get off the plane and the plane continues on to the Galapagos Islands. And after uh, about two hours over water, small specks of land begin to appear. And we see the islands that are the Galapagos Islands, a, uh, a, a, a group that uh, has achieved outsized recognition because of Darwin's voyage and some of the observations that he made there. 
One of the most iconic birds in the Galapagos is the blue-footed booby that you see here. Here, this bird is isolated. He's just like the, uh, the Andean cock of the rock. He's practicing, strutting his stuff in case a female should come along. But this bird is much luckier. He already has, and he is doing a lot of very dramatic schmoozing to convince her that he is the one for her. He makes sure that he steps around her, lifting his blue feet. And research has actually shown that the bluer the feet, the more healthy the bird. And so the female is being very smart when she's choosing a mate with very blue feet because he's a healthy bird, likely to be the carrier of big reproductive success. When uh, he can't get her attention, he, uh, he pulls the nuclear option. And uh, here he is, a bit like the great snipe that we saw in Norway, doing a very rapid flick of the wings, making himself as absolutely big as possible, and showing her what an amazing mate he is uh, likely to be. This is the classic mating dance of the blue-footed booby. Now, on an island the very northwest of the Galapagos called Genovesa Island, this bird that is all bill can be found. It is a large ground finch, one of the species of 15 birds that are collectively referred to sometimes as Darwin's finches. And if you haven't had a chance to read this book, The Beak of the Finch by Jonathan Weiner, that won a Pulitzer Prize, I strongly recommend it to you because what Weiner describes is he describes how a husband and wife team were able to show that you can see evolution in action by studying the beak of the finch. The birds evolve, they become successful or they die depending upon the size of their beaks in relation to the available seeds in the environment. And so Darwin didn't know that, but what he did know was that he said, seeing this gradation and diversity of structure in one small intimately related group of birds, one might really fancy that from an original paucity of birds in this archipelago, one species had been taken and modified for different ends. So there was Darwin in his notebook, not in his, uh, his book on evolution, but there was Darwin musing that these birds could have diversified and speciated from a single initial group. Now, this is another bird that uh, is a remarkable bird. And it also is something that puzzles me about Darwin and his the Galapagos. You see from its pathetic wings that it is a flightless bird. It's very similar to our cormorants. In fact, it's, uh, the genetics has shown that it's descended from a neotropical cormorant, but it has lost the ability to fly. And it's lost the ability to fly because flight really does three things for birds. It allows them to escape predators, it allows them to fly for food, and it allows them to migrate if they don't like the weather. Well, this bird is fortunate enough to have all the food it needs in its backyard. Um, it doesn't have any predators and the weather's great, so it doesn't need to migrate. So it has lost the ability to fly. Now, Darwin, act, this was uh, taken on Fernandina Island, and these birds inhabit this whole channel between uh, Isabella and Fernandina. And Darwin sailed up this channel, and he went to shore. He didn't go on Fernandina, but he went to shore on Is Isabella. And there is nary a mention of a flightless cormorant in his notebooks. And it's almost certain that he saw the flightless cormorant. And it seems that this would have been a wonderful example for him of how evolution had driven this bird to lose its flight. But he didn't see it, and uh, uh, it was a missed opportunity. Well, from the Galapagos, uh, we can't fly to Costa Rica, but we will go um, uh, back to uh, Quito. From Quito, 
we will hop our way uh, up to Panama, up to Panama City and into San Jose, Costa Rica. We will then take about a three hour drive from San Jose up into the Pacific lowlands. The last hour of it will be on a uh, rather bumpy dirt track to arrive at a lodge where this magnificent bird is waiting for us. This is a keelbuilt toucan. Uh, out of all the toucans uh, in uh, our hemisphere, I think it is the most beautiful. It looks really like a Disney bird to me, the way you would design a bird if you were a, a Disney designer. Magnificent, just daubs of color on its bill. It, uh, the bill actually is, was first thought that it was useful for plucking fruit from difficult places on trees. But we now know that it actually functions as a rather uh, efficient heat exchanger. It has a very copious blood supply and the bird pumps blood through the bill to cool it when the weather is really hot. They're very difficult birds to photograph in flight. And uh, here I was able to get a shot of this bird disappearing with a half a banana going back uh, to his nest. Well, we now are ready to uh, make landfall in the home country. We'll go from, uh, we'll drive the bumpy road back to San Jose. We'll uh, take a United Airlines flight into Houston and then on to um, Brownsville, a city just north of Matamoros on the uh, US-Mexican border to Green Island. And Green Island is a very interesting place. It is a uh, Audubon Island, a sanctuary. I've been fortunate to have been invited there twice. And I have photographed these birds, the roseate spoonbill, uh, together with reddish egrets, that both of these birds mate on um, Green Island. You see, they are of least concern at present. That was not always the case. They were eliminated from Florida, mostly because, again, of the feather trade. When Audubon uh, visited Panama City in Florida, he remarked on seeing fans made from roseate spoonbill's wings in the marketplace. Uh, he himself, of course, wasn't, uh, uh, didn't think twice before shooting any number of birds, uh, but that's a story for another day. That was uh, the technique of naturalists uh, back then. On our way home, we'll stop near Albuquerque in Bosque de la Pache, just north of the Mexican border again. And this is one of the few cranes that is doing well. Of the 18 species of crane, uh, 15 of them are endangered. The sandhill crane is thriving and uh, it migrates between uh, Bosque de la Pache and other region south uh, every, uh, every year and uh, to go to Bosque uh, uh, around Thanksgiving time when the cottonwoods are yellow and the sandhill cranes are flying is really one of the great joys uh, of bird photography. Cranes are well known for their ballet as we talked about with the Japanese red crown cranes and you can see this uh, sandhill performing a, a very beautiful bow for us here. Well, on north, we will make a brief stop at Big Sur in California. We'll, uh, we'll go to San Francisco and drive south a couple of hours. And there we'll see the bird that is most endangered of any bird that we have seen tonight. This is the California condor. The California condor has literally been clawed back from extinction by a human breeding and release program. It seems to be making headway. There are believed to be uh, between 40 and 150 of these birds still in existence. The California birds are captured every year and detoxified from lead that is in the carrion that they eat. There has been a huge effort to try and outlaw let, well, let's put it another way, to replace lead bullets with plastic bullets, which has been somewhat successful. 
but it's still really not clear whether these birds are ever going to be able to survive independently in the, uh, in the wild. From San Francisco, we'll take a quick trip out to Hawaii to meet a couple of birds that are on different ends of the endangered spectrum. The first is this very beautiful apapane, a, uh, a honey creeper that is doing well, thriving. And you see it's, uh, there are no hummingbirds in Hawaii, and so the honey creepers serve the function of uh, pollination of many of the flowers. The bird that's not doing so well is this very interesting bird, the Akiapola owl. This bird uh, feeds on uh, larvae that are buried in branches. And if you look at its bill, it's got a two function bill. Firstly, it's got a part like a woodpecker that uh, is, is straight and it drills the, the, uh, the wood with this straight part. Once the lava has been exposed, it extracts it with this long curly part. It is unfortunately um, heading for extinction because the tree that it uh, really likes is uh, becoming less and less. And of course, Hawaii has been a crucible for extinction where more birds have gone extinct since human contact than uh, uh, in many other places. Well, there is a, of course, a direct flight, uh, many direct flights from places in uh, Hawaii to SeaTac. We will come back to SeaTac. We've had a long trip, so we'll take the luxury of a Kenmore Air float plane from Lake Union, and we will arrive back in Lopez Island, where I can share with you the things that I have been doing during the lockdown. This is one of my lockdown projects where I'm trying to represent the landing pattern of bald eagles by stretching out the time axis to the right and showing their approach um, in their body postures in different wings. And they're, they're very different when there is wind, when there is high wind, when, when there is low wind. So uh, this is how I have been fortunate enough to be able to occupy myself during this, during this time. So it's time for me to uh, uh, thank you, my fellow travelers, for coming with me on this journey and for allowing me to uh, share my passion with you this evening. Thank you very much. So how do we applause, do applause on Zoom webinars? I don't know. Anybody know? No. <laughs> thank you so much, Peter. I'm inspired and fascinated and it cured a little bit of my wanderlust right now, but now I can't wait for all this to be over to, you know, get out there and learn even more about all these things. And yeah, just thank you. Thank you for doing this with us tonight. Um, there are a few questions. Um, I did also want to say thank you to the Lopez Center for Community and the Arts for that's where Peter is right now for allowing us to use their high speed internet for this um, tonight. But um, yeah, there let's oh, we've got some clap, clap, claps, magnificent Peter, some comments coming in on the Q&A too. So I guess that's how we do our applause on Zoom webinars. Um, but just getting to some questions here, and if you do have any questions, those of you who are watching us, um, please feel free to put them in right now. We have a little bit more time. Um, but are you ready, Peter, for your first question? I'm ready to go. Okay, so San Olson asks, Peter, any comments on the consequences of the fires in Australia on the birds? And thank you for that very topical question. And obviously, it has been absolutely disastrous, not only for birds, but for many species. I, I'm sure you saw the article just yesterday about platypuses, how they are being reintroduced. I don't have a clear idea yet of which uh, species uh, have survived um, and which have not. Um, but it's clear that this is the new normal in many parts of the world. And I think that it's going to be hastening the loss of many of these birds that, uh, that we love so much. Okay. Um, so Jean Helfman asks, what were the snowy owls doing in Boundary Bay and why the crowd? Hello, Jean. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, yeah, it was a remarkable event. Um, 
they were lined up all around Boundary Bay. And I, I understand at the end of the season that they didn't all make it. There, uh, they came uh, looking for food and they were hunting that marshland that is between the walkway there and the, uh, and the bay, which uh, is a very extensive marshland when the tide is out, as you know. And so they, they came for the lemmings and for the small rodents that they were hoping to find there. Um, they are uh, crepuscular in that they do um, feed during the day, which makes it wonderful for the photographers. But I have, somebody on the, on the webinar, correct me if I'm wrong, but I have not seen, um, I have not seen any snowies or heard of any snowies in Boundary Bay for the last five years. So we haven't been lucky enough to attract them back. Okay, um, next question from Reed Betts. What is your favorite bird? Oh, Reed, thank you for the question. Um, my favorite bird changes all the time, but my current favorite is the keel-billed toucan. It was my, uh, my pre-COVID bird. It was the trip I went on specifically to photograph the keel-billed toucan. And so I now have it as my enduring favorite, and I just totally love that bird. Awesome, great. Okay, well, that's all question-wise unless, oh, wait, wait, nope. Here's another one from Reed. If you could go to one place to see birds, where would you go? Um, there are some places that I have not been. Um, and and I, uh, I know that um, I did catch a, a little bit of Lovell's uh, brother-in-law who uh, has done a lot of work in the South Pacific. Uh, I would love to see uh, some of the birds uh, of the islands north of uh, Australia. Um, I, I would like to go to India. There are some amazing birds in, in India that I have, uh, that I would love to see. Um, Antarctica has a particular draw for me, even though it doesn't have a big diversity of wildlife. The adventure and the, uh, the, the excitement of being in Antarctica uh, I, I don't, that's really hard to, uh, hard to match anywhere else. Great. Okay. And um, Marta Green says, thank you so much. What a gift this has been to be on this journey. She just wants to know though, where do we go within the region and um, when to have the potential to see something rare here? Yes. Well, um, birders call these things vagrants, birds who happen to uh, lose their way and and come uh, <coughs> and come visiting. And in fact, I, I having said there were no snowy owls, there are people on the webinar that know much better than I uh, uh, the, where the vagrants are. But I believe there was a snowy owl seen on Lopez last winter. Um, but I think that rarity. What's happened for me during the the, the pandemic is that. I mean, I am an incurable traveler. I'm traveling all the time in normal times. But what's happened to me is that instead of looking for something rare, I have been looking again at the birds that I know and love and learning more about them. Like my work with the Eagle Landing, I, I, bald eagles are fascinating to me. And so I think the, the, the way to not get frustrated that you're not looking at a resplendent quetzal, you're just looking at a um, uh, let's say a northern flicker, is to have the joy of the birds that you have and take the time to learn more about the birds that live and the, and the animals and the plants that, that are in your neighborhood. And I think that um, can be really very fulfilling. I don't say it's as fulfilling as, uh, as the experiences you get when you go to a, a new culture and you see new, new animals, but it can be very fulfilling. And I think it's a way to feel good about being in one place. Okay, um, from Chris Allen, how do female, hor female hornbills exit the Walden nest? Chris, how nice to, 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 to hear you. Um, well, what happens is that they, together the male and the female, they have blocked the entrance, and this isn't very uh, hygienic, but they blocked it with feces and feathers and mud, they simply chip it away 
and uh, she has regrown her feathers in the uh, in the interim and she emerges from the nest and then the chicks emerge from the nest i would love to be at the nest when that is happening i have not seen it and i would just love to be you know, it's amazing for a photographer when you find these hornbill nests because you know you're guaranteed some really great photographs. In one study, a, um, a, a, a trumpet or hornbill like the one I showed you came to the nest throughout the day every 10 minutes. I mean, that's how faithful he was to his mate. And so once you find this nest, you're, you don't need to do anything else for the next day because you're, you're just there to try and get the very best photograph you can of this rather unique uh, situation. So, yeah. Um, and just some of you I know, it sounds like you're raising your hands, a few of you. If you, if you have a question, go to the Q&A function. It's the bottom kind of more right-hand section, right kind of the first one from the leave button. So if you have a question, you can type it in there and hopefully that'll, that'll work for you. Um, okay, so next question um, from Toby Cooper. Are the South Georgia kings showing problems with climate change like some of the other Antarctic penguins? And how do we sign up for the trip on the, uh, uh, say the name of the boat? On the Ushuaia. That's right, yes. Yes, so yes, the, the South Georgia kings are facing a huge challenge. And the challenge is not so much the effects of climate change in Antarctica yet, which as we know, are more marked than almost anywhere else in the world. But they are facing a challenge that for some reason, our civilization has developed the need to harvest more krill. And the Japanese in particular and the Chinese are sending fishing fleets into the Antarctic Ocean to fish for krill, which is the primary source of food for king penguins. And they're using it, as I understand, mostly for pet food. There are, there's a treaty, there are discussions about trying to limit the amount of krill that's taken, but krill is, the, the shortages of krill are likely to be a bigger challenge at the moment than climate change, although I'm sure that climate change will eventually overtake this. Um, there have been some dramatic failures of penguin colonies. I'm sure some of you have read about an Adelie penguin colony where every single chick in the colony died last year. They did not have one single success of uh, uh, a reproductive success. And so penguins are going to feel the brunt of climate change in a, in a very significant way. Okay. Um, okay, this is from Teresa and Semendinger. I hope I said that right. Um, the golden-headed quetzal has a short tail as opposed to the quetzal of, of Costa Rica. Uh, oh, sorry, that's a question. Yeah. So they have, a, they have a short, yep, they have a shorter tail. So, okay. yes, uh, you're absolutely right. The, the, um, the resplendent quetzal has um, magnificent tail streamers, two of them. And uh, I know this um, from a hard-learned lesson that I, I staked out a, a, a resplendent Quetzal's nest in Costa Rica a couple of years ago and was so thrilled when I thought I had just the picture that I wanted. I got back to my computer, put it up, and I found out that this particular male bird had lost one of its streamers in a fight. And so uh, I have a one-tailed Quetzal picture. So that's another reason I want to get traveling and go back and uh, get a good picture of a resplendent Quetzal. And then she also wants to know, and where are all the places you've been? Um, where are the, um, let's see, and where of all the places you've been is the best birders place in your opinion? Um, I think I would have to say Peru. I think that in Peru, you can find such diversity from small hummingbirds to uh, macaws to beautiful showy birds. Um, it's, it's, Peru is truly a, uh, a, uh, a paradise for a bird photographer or a birder. All right, from Sasha Kavanaugh. Interesting. Oh. Um, <laughs> you might know that one. But this is a great question for all of us who, who don't know. What sparked your interest in birds? Um, 
Well, uh, Sasha is my daughter, and I sometimes think my kids think I'm a little weird because I spend a lot of time looking at birds. But um, um, I, what sparked my interest in birds was coming to live in the Pacific Northwest. And I, I remember the very first day I came up to Skagit County in the winter. And uh, it was a, a January morning, and I came up to Fur Island, and I saw short-eared owls uh, scrapping with northern harriers. I saw um, swans. I saw thousands of snow geese. I saw eagles taking the snow geese. And uh, at that moment, I decided that this was what I wanted to do. I wanted to photograph um, birds in flight. And flight's a particular interest of mine. And uh, in Skagit County in the winter, you you can't escape it, they're flying all around. And so from that moment onwards, um, uh, this became something I wanted to do. And so uh, that has been, uh, that's where all these photographs uh, came from, from that, uh, from that moment and that desire. And of course, photography is a very good thing for nerdy people to be interested in. I mean, you know, there's lots of gadgets, lots of tech, lots of stuff to read. So it, it sort of, Satisfied, satisfies one's, um, uh, one's, one's nerd um, characteristics. Okay. Okay, so from Frederick Matson, thanks, Peter. How long do you typically have to post up to get a good shot of a bird in flight? Rick, thanks for that question. Um, so I spend an awful lot of time waiting for birds to fly. And um, it's rare that I just walk around with the camera hoping to see birds flying. I, I sometimes do. But I have um, evolved to the point where I am much more likely to go to a place where I know the bird is going to come to. Because for me, a landing shot is much more dramatic than a shot of the bird just flying uh, or a shot of the bird taking off. Um, when I first started, I would take a picture of any bird I could find against the white sky. And uh, my wife, Annie, is an artist, and I would show her the pictures very excitedly, and she'd kind of look at them, and she'd turn her nose up, and she'd say, oh, another bird against the blue sky. And um, I eventually started listening to that, and um, I tried to get more habitat in my pictures now. If you can not only convey the beauty of the bird, the anatomy of the bird, the biomechanics of the bird, and the nature of the habitat. You've, done a, you've made a lot of statements in one image compared to just taking a picture of a bird against a white or blue sky. And so I do spend a lot of time. For example, in the last three months, I probably have spent 200 hours underneath a tree where I know bald eagles come uh, quite often. And sometimes they come, sometimes they don't. And when they do come, I get a picture like that last picture that I showed you. So Rick, the answer is a lot of time. But then uh, I'm retired, so I have that time. And maybe you'll join me sometime soon. There you go. Um, from Elliot Birch, can you comment on how the diversity and abundance of the birds that utilize the Salish Sea have changed over the decades? We always think that the ocean environment here is pretty slim as far as seeing birds. Elliot, thanks for the question. And there are people um, on Lopez Island that can answer that question quantitatively for you. Uh, you know, in these days of where we all need quantitative COVID data, we also need quantitative bird data because when a bird becomes less common in your neighborhood, what you don't know is you don't know whether it is generally in decline or whether it's just moved off somewhere else. And so for the last 10 years, um, a group led by Russell Bosch, who runs a, uh, a nonprofit called Quiet, um, Russell and his collaborators um, have, have surveyed birds on Lopez Island regularly, weekly at different locations. And they have looked at the variation in uh, uh, in, in numbers by species from year to year. 
And uh, Joe Benke is currently the guy who does those surveys and he also does surveys of Iceberg Point. So I would be happy to put you in touch with Joe and boy, does Joe have the data. He has data on every species. I, I would say though that I, it is not my impression that the Salish Sea is deficient in birds. I think we have a lot of birds. They change in their numbers uh, together with the availability of food. But uh, I would really encourage you to contact either Russell or Joe and I can provide that contact information and, and they will give you the data on almost every species that's in our neighborhood. Yeah, that San Olson had a similar question, which, you know, I think I'm seeing fewer local and seasonal birds on South Lopez. Is this a function of not paying attention or environmental issues? So well, probably the same, yeah. Yeah, and Sen, I know you pay attention. So I, I, there, there no doubt are some real changes that you're seeing. And I think the question we need to ask is, uh, are those birds decreasing regionally or is it just locally that they're not here anymore? Okay, um, just a few more questions. Um, Mary Meredith says there was also a snowy owl on Orcas a year or two ago. Um, so she heard of some sightings. So, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. yeah. And then our, uh, when that happens again, call me up. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. And then our last question is from Janet Alderton. What fascinated you before birds? Um, Janet, thank you for the question. Um, as far as uh, uh, natural history was concerned, I had a general interest, but never a targeted interest such that I do now. Uh, like you, Janet, I've been involved in science for many years. And so science was fascinating to me in, in its own right. The, the scientific process, the, the, the process of inquiry, uh, the whole academic process of exploration and publication really pretty much obsessed me for the first uh, 30 years of my career. And so uh, I think uh, when I came out here, uh, thanks to Rick Matson, I, I did start to raise my eyes and to see that uh, there were other things besides uh, working in the lab 18 hours a day. One could do that too, but one would need to go and do some other things. So those have been my epiphany, I think, uh, Janet, in terms of uh, broadening my outlook uh, on life in general. And I think in many ways, I, I sometimes call birds a gateway drug because once you start to study birds, uh, you, you inevitably start to study the environment that they live in and its state and uh, how it's, um, uh, whether there is pollution or whether there is encroachment. And this leads you into the whole chain of things that are supporting these animals that you have a particular interest in. So I think that having, uh, having hooked on to birds, it then leads you to many other conservation and preservation issues that you become aware of. Okay, that is the last question. And uh, Peter, if there's, um, yeah, again, I could listen to you talk about this stuff all night long. So, and I have a feeling, right, let's keep our fingers crossed that this time next year, we can do more live presentations with you to learn even more. Um, but thank you all so, so much for attending tonight. And if you have any follow-up questions, um, you know, you can go to our website um, and I, my contact information is up there, katie at sanwans.org, and I can direct you to Peter or anybody else you might have questions um, for. But again, it's really good to see a lot of your names pop up tonight. It makes me feel better that our community is still out there. And Peter, I can't think of a better person to have done our first webinar with. And I just thank you so much for sharing what you did with us tonight. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Katie, and thank you all for, uh, for listening. Thank you. We'll see everybody soon, I hope.